Kate here to film the garden book tag. I knew I wanted to film this at some point this week. And then when I was out earlier today, I saw all these beautiful wild flocks in a field near a library that I was at and I just had to pick them and I thought it would be nice to have them displayed for the garden book tag. And they smell so fragrant, so nice. They smell kind of similar to a hyacinth, if you know what that smells like. So I don't think I was actually tagged by anyone for this, but it was so much fun. I really wanted to do it. And I thought kind of, you know, springtime heading into summer was a great time for that. So the questions are all flower themed, which is really fun. And if I can find a picture of each one, I will display a picture because I don't know what all these look like. So it'd be nice to have a visual for anybody else who also doesn't know flowers very well. And the first question says, Rambler Rose, a long read with multiple main characters and plot lines. It twists, turns, and puts on a show. And I had to put uh, the most recent Wheel of Time book that I've read, The Fires of Heaven. Oh my goodness, so many main characters, so many plot twists, so many elements, such a epic, big scale, humongo storyline. And with each one I read, the more rewarding this story is getting. It's definitely a lot of work to get through this. But like I said, I just feel more rewarded with each book that I go through. And I'm so happy that I just continue to try this. You know, not read too many in succession, take a break between them, and then just kind of go for it when I am reading. Just enjoying it so much and seeing developments and changes in characters that I wasn't expecting and things happening with the plot and also apparently just some books that uh, like th things you hear mentioned in book one are going to be mentioned in like book 13. So I am just really looking forward to that. Uh, question two says the hybrid tea rose, a modern and long last modern and long lasting, a collection of memorable 20th or 21st century poetry. So if I could put up emojis right now, it would be the monkey face emoji with him covering his eyes because he's so embarrassed. I am very ignorant about poetry and I feel like I don't know enough to even really give an adequate answer to this because I've only read a couple different poets. Um, something that I just keep not making time for. Question three says, Lilacs, size seasonally inspired book I look forward to revisiting every year. And I have two. One is uh, obvious season, and that is the Christmas season. And I've talked before on my channel about Christmas at Fair Acre by Miss Reed. This includes The Christmas Mouse, Christmas Village, and No Holly for Miss Quinn. Extremely well-written, cozy, charming, twee, um, stories and just I love them so much just very cozy Christmas reads and then one that isn't like I don't know if it would make other people feel of a season but for now and eternity Ella Enchanted will always make me think of summer so another spoiler alert for my summer TBR I have a tradition now of reading rereading Ella Enchanted every summer and because I, I read it as a kid but then two years ago I ended up listening to the audiobook and it's such a fabulous audiobook. It has a girl, a young girl who's doing the voice of Ella and narrating the whole story and it has some instruments and things. And I don't know about any of you, but for some reason, um, the two like extreme weather seasons, winter or summer, feel more like magical that, you know, you could happen upon some magic. And so that's a time that I really appreciate reading things that have magic in them. So Ella Enchanted is another one. So that one is my, my summer seasonal read. Then question four says, Bleeding Heart, a beautiful dark work that broke your heart. And I immediately thought of Kristen Labrin's Daughter by Sigrid Unset. And this is an amazing opus that uh, Sigrid Unset wrote. It's set in medieval Norway and it's about the life of Kristen Labrin's Daughter and just kind of the things that she really wants and everything in her life that she's willing to sacrifice to get what she wants and then the consequences of the sacrifices that she has given. It's really intense but poignant and so beautifully and hauntingly written. I highly, highly recommend it, especially if you want um, maybe for like the winter months, something that really fits the mood of the weather. I highly recommend it. Uh, the next question is Queen Anne's Lace a work that is sometimes seen as a weed, but you see it as great literature. 
and I would say Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day by Winifred Watson. This is one that is a modern classic. It's Persephone Classics number one seller, so it's very well loved. And it is kind of sort of a Cinderella retelling about Miss Pettigrew who is hired out by a temp agency and she shows up to the wrong house. And the woman whose house she shows up to, Miss LaFosse, is her life is kind of in a shambles and Miss Pettigrew ends up kind of fixing her life over the course of the day. But then Miss Pettigrew's life is made better, you know, over the course of the day. And I bring this up because there are some people who there is definitely some anti-Semitism in here and some more uh, like chauvinistic, misogynistic comments, things that are just not treating women as they are equals. And I do, I totally agree that's all in there. But what I keep coming back to with this and other older books that have not 21st century values in them is that they are older books. They're going to feel older, they're going to feel maybe different um, than what people think today. I love this book and um, I really enjoy it personally. And the next question is question six, Forget Me Not, an early bloomer, a work you read early in life and will never forget. And one that I actually had neglected to talk about on this channel thus far and that is Beautiful Joe. I do not own a copy. My dad owns a copy. This is a really great, lovely children's animal story. Uh, and it's about this dog named Joe who uh, is born w on a farm. And I will say for those of you who are very sensitive, there are some really terrible things that happen to animals, really terrible treatment of animals that start out. So if you're sensitive to that, you might want to skim through the beginning. And um, you know, really bad things that happen to him, but then this really wonderful, lovely, lovely family takes him in and he just has such a wonderful life with them and they have this whole menagerie of pets and it's just a really great book and I remember my dad reading it aloud to me and just being so caught up in the story. Question seven, pansies, a classic that's losing their popularity. Once upon a time, everyone had them in their garden or library. And I think an author that uh, came to mind when I thought of this question is Neville Shute. So Neville Shute wrote from like the 40s to the 70s, just good old adventure stories. There's not, they're not wordy, they're not flowery. The character development is um, middling at best, but the art of storytelling in the pacing of the plot is fabulous, phenomenal. If you just want, I really think in summertime especially, if you just want a great adventure tale, Neville Shute is who you should check out. And they are, but they're very eloquent at the same time, like a, like an elegance to the simplicity, if that conveys. And the first one that I read by him is Pied Piper. And the main character's name is John Howard. His names are just very generic British, so I had to look it up. John Howard, and he travels to France and while he's in France, the Second World War really kicks into gear. And then he ends up basically just, as he's trying to get back home to England, having these different children that are just kind of, he has to take care of them. He has to get them to England safely with him. And so it's just a really like edge of your seat read. And then the other one that I read from him is Trusty from the Tool Room. And this guy is Keith Stewart. And he and his wife are caring for their niece while his brother and uh, sister-in-law are traveling overseas to America. They're going to make a life for themselves there. Eventually they are shipwrecked and Keith realizes that the niece's um, fortune is in the boat. And so he travels and he does all kinds of crazy traveling, just catching rides on ships and planes and trains and just going all over trying to get to this money just because he cares about his niece so much. The money is not for him and he just wants to get it for her. So he's definitely a very noble character. And I really enjoy these and I do recommend them. And then the next question says, Trillium, native to North America and some provinces and states. It's illegal to pick these, a banned or challenged book. And I did not realize until I did some Googling that As I Lay Dying by Mr. William Faulkner has been banned at several points and, and I quote, for coarse language and dialect. <laughs> so um, 
I love that because that's like William Faulkner's jam, course language and dialect. This book was amazing. It was such a unique book, different from any other book I had ever read. I read it last summer and is still so vivid in my mind. I know I will most definitely be rereading this, but first I want to read some more Faulkner. And it's just an amazing piece of literature about um, this family that they, the, the Bundren family, and the mother is dying, hence the title, and she wants to get back to uh, where her, she was born, where her family is from, and buried there. Kind of views that as like the home for her body. And so they are, you know, it starts out, they're building the coffin. She can hear them sawing the wood and building the coffin outside her bedroom window. So it's definitely very dark and haunting Southern Gothic, and I just love it so much. Uh, the next question says, question nine, Orchid, a work that was as challenging to read and maintain as an orchid, and that a recent one that I read and reviewed is Daniel Deronda by George Eliot. This one comes in at 687, 88 pages, and this definitely was um, some work to get through, but Oh my goodness, boy, did it ever repay me. This story is going to stay with me very vividly for a long, long time. And it's basically about Gwendon Harleth, who's trying to um, seek her fortune, and whether that be through marriage or other means. And then Daniel Deronda, the title character, is trying to figure out kind of what he wants to do with his life and what he, what will make him happy. And he's also trying to find out more about his own family history and just... Yeah, the, this was so excellent and a uh, whole slew of interesting characters and I really do recommend it. It did definitely take a lot of concentration, but boy did it pay me back in the end and I'm so glad that I read it. Uh, okay, and then question 10 says, a Fern, a book that sparked my initial interest in a topic before uh, turning into a whole TBR of books on that topic. And where is it? I set it down. So, unfortunately, I do not read enough nonfiction. I know this is true, but I have, I kind of formed my own answer for this. It might be cheating, but when I read Ella Enchanted, it did make me realize how much I love the fairy tale retelling sort of genre, subgenre, and it made me really want to try more fairy tale retellings. It really spurred me on. So I have actually, you know, this year been reading a fair number of fairy tale retellings and it's been really great and so much fun. So I know that probably technically doesn't count for this, but I really liked it. So let's see, who should I tag? I'm going to tag um, Kate from the Novel Nomad for your Tag Tuesdays, Kate. And I will tag Katie from Books and Things, Carolyn from BBC Girl, Stephanie from That's What She Read, April from Getting Hugo With It. Uh, I think, I think that's who I'll do for now. But either way, I hope you guys enjoyed this and I will see you for another video soon. Bye.